Hello everybody, my name is Boulevard and welcome to the ninth seasonal edition of Tournament Tactician for A Curious Journey Seasonal happening this weekend. Now, if you're just looking for the cliff notes, if you think you've got a solid grasp, you don't want to watch anything that's going to really sway you too much or make you second guess your lineup, uh, the competitive review article that I wrote for Giant Slayer is in the description below. That'll kind of give you the cliff notes. I did write that last night, so not an insane amount has changed between my writing of that article and my shooting of this video in terms of like my opinion on the meta or anything like that. So it's good information still, but let's, let's get straight into the tier list because there's some primers that I need to give you. So the tier list looks a little bit different. Let me break down exactly what we're looking at here. Zigstalia, Pantheon, Ophelios. Those are your top three decks. Those are going to, when we look at the top 32 breakdown for the seasonal on Monday, Zigstalia, Pantheon, and Ophelios are going to be the three decks with the most players in the top 32. The order of them, I do not know. I don't think it's particularly important. If I had to guess, I would say Ophelios number one, Zigstalia number two, Pantheon number three, but that's pretty arbitrary and doesn't matter too, too much. So... When we move outside of that big three, everything's a bit of a toss-up. When we look at top eights, we're seeing like Zigstilia, Pantheon, Ophelios. Obviously, those are putting up numbers. And then everything else is kind of a one-of, maybe a two-of. Nothing is really sticking out as a definitive number four or five in the meta right now. FTR is very good on ladder, but as you can see here, it doesn't do very well into either of the top, and, and really any of the top three decks. And that's one of the reasons that like Sundisk has moved down. So what we're looking at here is because these three are so dominant in the meta, are so in control of everything, I have broken down how the rest of the tier list pairs into those decks, with it being color-coordinated here, so that you can tell red is, this is a bad matchup for you, uh, orange is unfavored, yellow is favored, green is good. Uh, the only actual 50%, because you're like, oh, is 50% favored? is like 50 point something, right? So technically, yes, you're favored. The only 50-50 matchup that I found that wasn't a mirror match was actually Jace Heimer into Aphelios. Uh, that's a 50-50, but I didn't want to throw on a th another color just for that one thing. So, for example, Field of Rush, great ladder deck, bad into Zigstalia, sub-45% win rate into Zigstalia, and then unfavored, which means 45 to 49% into Pantheon and Aphelios. And this is probably what you want to be looking at, not only when you are building your lineup from the ground up, but also if you're just looking for like a third deck to throw in there. And something that I really value right now, something that I'm pretty big on, is just playing pirates in your lineup. You don't have to be triple aggro. I've talked about this before. Triple aggro, historically, is, is one of the worst lineups in seasonal history for conversion rate from Swiss to top 32. You cannot just say, oh, I'll just play triple aggro and I'll top the seasonal. That almost never happens. In the three seasonals we have had so far since the release of Bandle City, Beyond the Bandlewood, Between Worlds, A Magic Misadventure. There has only been one triple aggro player to make top 32. And even that was debatable on whether it's really aggro because it depends on how you view scouts because their lineup was like spiders, scouts, and nightfall. And what does do well is two aggro decks and an aggressive mid-range deck. For example, I think Beyond the Bandlewood was ruled by like, um, or, or not even Beyond the Bandlewood, I think it was Between Worlds, was all like aggro, aggro, scion, or like aggro, aggro, Sivarokshan, right? These decks that still have... Uh, they're not aggro decks, not by a country mile, like Scion and Sivir, these are not aggro decks, but like they, they are aggressive mid-range decks, um, which Scouts falls more on the aggro side of that than something like Draven Scion, but you, you get what I'm saying here. At least I hope you do. If you're going to top the seasonal, I think you understand what I'm saying here. <laughs> um, so I think that like Pirates is, is fine to just throw in your lineup. You don't even necessarily need to find a second aggro deck alongside it, because the problem that aggro is running into is that Pirates is very good. It is one of the only... Actually, I think it is literally the only deck on the tier list with a favorite, with a good matchup into two of the top decks. And I think if you look at the charts for Aphelios, I think pretty much everybody is going to be a, on the ban Aphelios plan. Now, while most lineups are looking to ban the Aphelios, there is one lineup I can think of off the top of my head that is looking to ban something else. And that is actually the XYZ lineup itself. If you are playing Zigstalia, Pantheon, and Aphelios, and you trust the stats... You should actually be banning Pantheon in the mirror match because Aphelios and Pantheon beat Zigstalia, and then Pantheon beats Aphelios in that head-to-head. -head. So what I would be looking to do, and what I think you're going to see a lot of high-level players doing, a lot of people having success with, is dropping one of these decks and only playing two of these, just playing the X and Y and looking for that third deck. Now, it doesn't not matter what your third deck is. I'm not really going to go into what your third deck should be because that is something I haven't put a whole lot of thought into. I would definitely pick a comfort deck. Uh, as we always say, comfort is king. And as I always say, you should probably be comfortable on the three best decks. But if you if you just drop one of these decks, it will really throw off anybody who is looking to soft counter this lineup because they, they're not soft countering all three. They're only soft countering one, maybe two of them 
And if you happen to drop the one that they were looking to soft counter, then you are in for a good time. Now, the ones that I see people looking to soft counter the most often are Pantheon and Zigtalia. And with Zigtalia being the weak link of the XYZ mirror match, I think that there is merit in dropping either Pantheon or Zigtalia. I don't think you're going to see too many people dropping the Aphelios because there's just not a lot of decks that are consistently beating it. So before I move on to what the rest of the field looks like, I want to talk about the commonality between the big three that is separating them from the rest of the pack. When you look at these three decks, what are they all doing similarly that is so good that they are so far above everything else? Number one, they don't have an unplayable early game. All three of these decks play one drops. Inventive Chemist in Talia, Saga Seeker in Pantheon, Fizz slash Yordle Squire in Aphelios. Meaning that if you just run into the, a random aggro pile, you can at least mulligan to play a tempo game, you know, wall up, make it to the mid late game, stabilize, all that good stuff. Number two is that they all have very explosive potential. I think with a perfect hand, or even just a great hand, all three of these decks can probably kill you on turn six. You know, you'll level the Talia, you'll level the Ziggs, you'll get off a Magus or like Absolver them or whatever, um, and just kill your opponent very quickly. And it tends to come a little bit out of nowhere. You know, Pantheon, obviously, if you get that Zenith Blade plus White Flame combo and like find a Cataclysm, yeah, you're actually probably killing on turn six. Aphelios, I don't need to explain that one. Like you just throw a Papercraft on a Fizz next turn, they're probably dead, right? And when we look at the other decks in the meta, there's not a lot of these decks that you really think of are going to accidentally kill you on turn six like a lot of them are just looking to kill on like turn eight uh scion usually not killing on turn seven mostly killing on turn eight Sivir auction is just like so mediocre into the big three and it really needs like a near perfect hand to actually kill you on six i think for the most part Sivir auction's looking at like turn seven turn eight kills and just these are really the only decks in the game that i can think of that like have this passable early game have this huge explosive potential that can just absolutely kill you a lot sooner than the rest of the meta is looking to kill you. So that is, in my mind, what it, what is separating these. is On top of that, if they have to play a long game, they do that fairly well. Aphelios, obviously, with just that champion on top of all of the, gener the continuous generation of having attached units going back to your hand when that unit dies, it's going to let you scale into the late game. So even if you're against control and like your units are just getting killed on site, like you still have cards to play. You can still outgrind your opponent. Pantheon kind of doing the same thing in that Pantheon, if you roll Spell Shield one time, suddenly taking quite a few resources out of your opponent, on top of the fact that like a Vengeance is probably going to be required onto a Wounded White Flame at some point, or even a Saga Seeker, Yumi is just this continuous card generation. You get the card draw out of the Zenith Blade, as well as these cantrips that are also combat tricks. So like Pantheon and Aphelios, I think, are just doing a very good job of maintaining resources throughout the game in a, in a good hand. And then Zigstalia. Probably, I wouldn't say, like, holds on to resources as well as Pantheon and Aphelios, but, like, Hourglass is just one of the best cards in the game right now. You have these Endless Devouts, which are going to be very difficult for a lot of decks to deal with, and can be used with something like Desert Naturalist or even Rite of the Arcane to just give you the, this huge tempo swing that feels like enough of an advantage generator um, that you are probably just going to win that game regardless. So that's kind of what these three have, is, like, passable early game, even into aggro, surprise kill earlier than the rest of the meta is doing and good card generation that allows them to scale into the late game if need be um not like perfect concise points but that's that's sort of the three things that are really separate like these all three of these decks do all three of these things and you're not really finding another deck that does all three especially not the turn six kill the turn six kill is what's really separating these from the rest of the pack i think so when we look outside of the big three towards the rest of the field what are we looking at boulevard yeah i, I don't want to look at this right now tell me what the rest of the field is going to be the Online League series in the Mastering and Terror Opens both happened this past weekend. Each of them had 18 of a possible 24 unique decks amongst their top 8 competitors, which basically means the big 3 and then a bunch of one ofs. And amongst those one ofs, we found a lot of control, just not a lot of overlap in control, because there's just like 10 different control decks right now. There's Feel the Rush, there's Viego, there's Viego, there's Tribeam, there's Darkness, there's Luxophelios, there's Sentinels, there's Jace Lux, there's Jace Heimerdinger. There's just a, a lot of control decks right now. So that's what the general field is looking like. But on top of that, Scion and the Rubin Pile have still been sort of maintaining a presence. I think as a Aphelios has sort of proven itself to be more of a top tier deck and less of a gimmick, more people are off of the Rubin pile, or if they are, they're onto like Zoe Vi or like Victor Vi or something along those lines. But I, I don't really like the Rubin pile without Aphelios as much, but that's that's a personal thing, um, which is part of the reason that the Rubin pile, the Rubin pile should probably be on here. That was an oversight on my end, but I'm already so far into shooting this that it's too late to go back. So... If you want to know what you're going to be looking at outside of these, you're like, hey, you know, uh, I, I'm, I have something that's like going to hard target the Pantheon, but I need to make sure I'm not losing to everything else. What is everything else? Everything else in a broad sense is control and Draven Scion. 
So that's kind of what we're looking at in the rest of the field. But for the most part, I'm not going to get too much into like how the tier two and three decks interact with each other. That's where you've got to come in and do a little bit of legwork. But if we had to break down what the two decks rounding out the top five are with our big three, I would guess Shurima, Viego, and Draven Sion. FTR, I think, is going to be kind of on the cusp. Like, it might be number six or seven. I don't think Pirates or Scouts break into the top five because they have to split Misfortune, which means they have to split their top 32 presence. And then nothing else is really calling to me as, like, a super popular option for players to break into the top five with, at least, in terms of play rate. But, you know, to try and give you a general idea of what the field's going to look like, uh, I, I want to kind of guess at what the top 32 is going to be. I think, like, I think two of these decks put more than 16 players into the top 32. I think one of them might even put over 20. But I think only one of them puts over 20. I think one of them puts over 16. I think the other one puts like 14. And then I think Viego Shirima probably going to have like 8 to 12. And then Draven Sion probably like 7 or 8. And then everything else is like 6 and 5. But even that's kind of hard to predict because like there's just going to be a lot of one ofs. There are going to be decks that I have never laid eyes on that have top that will top this tournament. And I would say that there's probably going to be at least at least three decks that I have never seen before that top 32 this seasonal. Which makes it really hard to prepare you for the open field. And that is why I would cling so tightly to an XYZ lineup. Or at the very least, XY pick a third deck. Which again, that is I want to reiterate, that is what I would go for, is XY pick a third deck. Now, if I had to pick my lineup, you know, I, I would probably drop the Zigstalia from my XYZ because it is the weak link of the mirror match. You know, it is the one that they're kind of looking to 2-0. It's the bad matchup in the Pantheon and Ophelios. And I would try to find something that would make my opponent's ban strategy a little bit awkward. I want to find something that is still beating Zigstalia so that I still have that avenue of 2 0 their Zigstalia that the XYZ is kind of looking for in the mirror match. And I want to find something that makes them consider banning that instead of my Pantheon. And that's kind of like that mystical magical third deck you're looking for. And that's really all I can give you because, again, it, it is going to be a very wide open field. I wouldn't look at counter picking too hard. Again, I, I'm always a fan of soft countering, not so much hard countering. But again, my, my recommendation is that uh, that XYZ lineup potentially dropping the Zixilia for something like I just mentioned. And that's really as much information as I can give you. Uh, unfortunately, like I had mentioned, this is going to be a very wide open seasonal. I wouldn't look at hard countering. Like I, I always say, don't hard counter. I would, again, advise against hard countering. But comfort is king. You should probably be comfortable on the top three decks, but if you're not, comfort is still king. Um, and ban a failios if you are not playing specifically the XYZ lineup. And that's, that's really all I can give you. I would love to get more in depth with you. This isn't like a time crunch thing. It's just like we've seen such diversity over the tournaments and the ladder that it would be disingenuous for me to try to be like oh well like here's the top 10 decks and here's what you can do to counter these and like if you don't run into the xyz like the, what was important if any if anything sticks if only one thing sticks out of this it's it's like this is what the xyz is this is what the matchup charts are for the the rest of the field sort of into the xyz and that's just kind of that. So I think this is like the shortest probably uh, seasonal edition of the tournament tactician, but I'm hoping that like this matchup chart does a lot of the talking that I did not do. And again, ultimately just the, the field is a little bit too open, but I sincerely hope that this helped in some capacity that you got at least one nugget of wisdom out of this. Again, as always, my name is Boulevard. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you so, so much for watching. And as always, good luck in your tournaments, especially the seasonal tournament 